very nice to be here within uh, this room of uh, dedicated uh, metabolism interestees, I would say. Um, your information is correct about my uh, position, but that was in the in the past. Like uh, I think for the last three years, um, I I'm not involved in that uh, in that uh, research program anymore. But um, I'm actually continuing it at uh, TU Delft in uh, um, yeah in the Netherlands. Um, yeah, my my name is Jan Jongert. Uh, my I'm one of the founders of SuperU Studios, which um, started off as an architecture firm in 1997, and um, developed into a firm that uh, much more uh, yeah started uh, producing many more types of services that went beyond architecture. I think a little bit the same uh, th that uh, happened to Fabric uh, in that way. Um, I, if I just make uh, one, uh, yeah, one statement about Super Use Studios is that we try to create as uh, much as possible value from what is already there. So we, we like a lot designers that uh, try to invent new designs and new techniques for the future, but we actually uh, think it's important to do uh, with what is already available and create the biggest value with that. And the designs that we're making and the tools are mainly focused on that. Um, why uh, urban metabolism is um, relevant in this is because it offers a good tool to, to understand our environment. And I must say that as trained as an architect, one of the uh, blank spots uh, I had was, was the economy. Um, like what really, uh, what is money doing? It was more like uh, something that in the end would um, yeah, minimize your impact than uh, then increase it. So I, I tried to make a, a very um, simple overview of uh, the, the history of economy <laughs> in from uh, our perspective. Um, if you're looking at it from the point of flows and also like how we see that our environment is changing because that's uh, to answer maybe what uh, the relevance of uh, metabolism is, is it uh, gives us tools to behave in the new, s new um, rapidly changing environment that we that we live in. So um, just to give a, a brief insight, the, the linear economy which uh, emerged after the industrial uh, industrialization, um, that was, uh, yeah, has been very effective for many decades. Uh, how it works is as a consumer, you pay very little for all the stages uh, when you buy a product. And in the ideal situation, you don't pay anything for the waste that is produced, uh, someone else will solve it or something else will solve it for you. Well, in the 70s, of course, we got the green economy. Um, every uh, step in the chain tried to improve its processes, polluting less and less. Um, of course, you have to pay a little bit more for all these, uh, uh, the for the products. Plus you have to pay um, either in taxes or uh, in fees for the waste that is being treated in a better way. A uh, kind of hidden cost in this is that you also need to pay for all the certificates and the mechanisms um, that need to control whether all these processes work like they are promised. So it's, an, um, it's a better approach, but uh, obviously much more expensive. I think it's something we're experiencing uh, right now. Then, of course, we are, um, I think, yeah, aware of the, the current development into a more circular economy, where I think most of the focus is based on closed loop systems where actually companies bind together and uh, make change chains that uh, circulate the resources that are available and maybe the biggest change in this is that the value of a waste is not you don't have to pay for it in the ideal situation but you receive money uh, for the waste that is produced um, in a very ideal situation, you don't need to extract any resources anymore uh, because infinite you have infinite loops of, uh, of resources. Uh, who is really controlling this is not yet decided and whether it's a very, um, um, yeah, a very uh, um, solid system that is able to deal with um, yeah, interruptions, like if one goes bankrupt, how do these um, how does this system behave over time? So uh, another parallel development that we are seeing is a much more um, dynamic one, uh, more the peer-to-peer -peer approach, 
where um, value is not created in a closed loop, but actually uh, is created in um, uh, the very complex system of the whole chain. And whoever is able to add the biggest value on a certain flow of material, um, either as a resource or as a waste, he will be able to uh, start creating that and build a business upon it. And uh, one of the um, yeah one of the examples that um, gives a name to this type uh, type is the is the blue economy that is uh, that we see emerging and see many companies developing from this principle. Um, this is uh, how we think the 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 society and the economy of the society will change to the future, much more into a, a dynamic environment where uh, you actually um, on a day-to-day -day basis will decide how flows and processes will happen. And because of this, you need an overview to know what's going on. And to make this very concrete, uh, I take one of the, the yeah, the, to me, the most favorite um, blue economy examples. Um, we were not involved in this as an office, but, uh, but I like the example very much because it very much shows the kind of problems that we're running into, either large scale or small scale in, um, in for instance, an environment like Sardinia, where at some point the oil flow stopped because of the revolution that took place in Libya. Uh, ENI was owning this uh, oil refinery. Uh, it decided to close it down. Uh, it had the empty uh, derelict huge plant, it had uh, a soil that was contaminated which was estimated to cost around 1 billion euros, uh, 8,000 employees uh, unemployed and of course on an island this generates a lot of um, yeah, secondary uh, uh, going down of the economy because people don't uh, spend less and uh, the economy of the island is declining. So this is a kind of multiple problems that occur and we see around us uh, happening a lot. Um, and this inspired uh, the company Novamont, a bioplastics company, to actually um, come up with a proposal to redevelop this factory into a bioplastics plant. Um, actually, the biggest part of the plant could be reused uh, because the, the process is more or less the same. Um, actually, the plants that were already growing around provide for the ingredients of the bioplastics, which were thistles um, that were growing there because the cattle had moved already. And um, on top of that, the uh, thistles also actually uh, play a role in cleaning the soil, so they could actually uh, naturally clean this soil without having to spend the 1 billion euros. Plus, the additional um, <coughs> Yeah, additional income that the farmers that also could, would have a job uh, could get is from the enzymes that are on top of these thistles because they could sell them to goat cheese producers. Um, so this is how a, multi yeah, a big uh, multi-layered problem by connecting different problems together can generate a new economical uh, driver for an environment. Um, so if you look at uh, Novamont Bioplastics, then uh, you'll find this example. It's, it's one of the blue ex economy examples. And in order to make these kind of transformations possible, um, we have um, yeah, an approach uh, to look at actually to look at the metabolism. And actually, only since yesterday, <coughs> I came up with this uh, division. Maybe um, uh, some of you already use it. But um, we look at it at three different levels. So uh, one is the object level, where you look really very uh, specifically at every object. What is its shape, its specifications, uh, etc. The other is the flow level, that is very much common to the metabolism. What are the real continuous flows of energy, etc., passing through? And the third one, the most complex one, is the actually, like it was mentioned in the in the lecture before, also the, sy the system, um, how it is behaving and what intervention is actually taking place, what intervention can actually create a positive contribution to the system. So these are three levels uh, that I want to explain a little bit because um, in our work we've been working on uh, at least the, the first two ones and are now moving into the third one as well. So to start with the object level, 
Um, this is very concrete. Like I said, our office likes very much to work with what is already there and to work now, uh, not to wait until an ideal environment has been created and then uh, design with that. So we are looking at, for instance, materials that are becoming redundant, like the blades of the windmill wings that are uh, replaced every 10 to 15 years. Um, they're currently they are taken off because of uh, insurance uh, and uh, um, yeah and, and their estimated lifespan, and the best that can happen is that uh, they are currently burned in um, incineration plants. Um, of course, um, this generates a little bit of energy, but not the amount of energy that ever was put into it. Uh, if you're looking at the flow level, by the way, it's around. Uh, 20 to 30,000 windmill blades already per year that are available. But as a designer, um, you can not do so much with that figure apart from estimating what uh, kind of how many products you would be able to make with it. But many of these blades have different specifications, and your purpose is different from uh, the specifications of each object. So that's why the object level is also a very important one. So for instance, from certain specifications, we are able to transform these blades uh, into functional playgrounds like in Rotterdam, um, where the size of them really allows for different uh, play functionality. Um, yeah, here you see the different uh, size objects uh, of the same, uh, same uh, resource uh, that create urban furniture or bus stops in Almere or currently we're constructing a playground, another playground in Terneuze in Zeeland. It's now, I think it's about to be finished uh, this week. Um, so that's what's possible with knowing enough about the, the individual objects. Another uh, example and where we are really already able to create value in the whole chain is this example where um, a truck factory in the south of the Netherlands produces waste steel it currently gets 25 cents from uh, the waste collector. It's uh, melted and then uh, turned into new steel. Um, we actually change the process or we have a collaboration with the waste collector to um, collect this material. Um, and we pay double the price to <coughs> the company that produces the waste. And um, it's not just that, but we earn something from the design or the trade that is taking place. The Fagansa Winkel is earning a little bit more because they're not waste collector anymore, but they're suddenly supplier to a building, a site. And the client has a material which is uh, 20 to 30 percent cheaper than if you would buy something similar new. So um, with this approach, we're able to create value for each part in the chain. Um, we are experimenting a lot, like I say, we are uh, designing um, projects ourselves with this, like uh, garden fences or two entrances to uh, a garden in um, a public garden in London with, of course, local resources. Um, or recently, more like a waste collection center, which also should be finished in two weeks, where 1,500 square meters of this material has been applied. Um, allowing actually this to become um, almost uh, standardized building material <coughs> for uh, buildings like this. But only by knowing exactly uh, the sizes of each frame, thicknesses that, uh, that are available uh, and the, the shape that is taken out of it. Um, like uh, I was introduced, we also produce tools. So in actually on this object level, we have um, uh, produced what we call harvest map. Um, it's a map that illustrates all the resources in the Netherlands that we know can produce uh, or can uh, um, deliver such materials. So we have around 250 of these resources in the Netherlands that uh, we can call, uh, but as well uh, the map is uh, publicly accessible so other uh, designers um, or builders can access this material as well. Th that's what we think is important. The the material resources should be um, yeah, made available to a wide as possible audience in order to grow this uh, local uh, yeah, value creation. Um, well, this is nice to do in the Netherlands, but um, like recycling industry is quite advanced uh, in the Netherlands, which also gives us a little bit of a setback because it's hard to intervene in current uh, recycling processes. 
So um, we made a move to um, find out if our approach also would work in China. And of course, there, like uh, the Shenzhen area, is a very useful one. Production is going on such big speeds with such amounts that um, we've, we've uh, actually found partners there to start developing similar approaches. So we went to factories, um, wood, uh, wood production factories, for instance, introduced harvest maps, found actually a very positive attitude towards this approach. Um, we already made connections between prototyping, um, uh, a prototyping company that uh, buys, that now buys the waste wood from a furniture factory. Um, just it was actually basically the first company we visited that already uh, started collaborating on this, uh, on this way. <coughs> Um, another yeah, uh, example of um, how currently uh, materials are being produced and what kind of waste flows are actually uh, produced, which are not even um, yeah, traditional waste. It's actually construction waste. Um, this is a window frame factory. It produces new windows. They produce 5% more <coughs> than uh, their demand. Um, this 5%. If you calculate this within the district that we investigated, it's a value of over uh, 1 billion euros on a yearly basis, which is, again, taken apart. Um, completely, completely new uh, certified windows taken apart. Glass is uh, going to the to an, um, a waste uh, dump, and the aluminum is uh, melted again. So there is a huge flow of materials that is actually not tapped into, which is actually new. Um, we thought this was a very interesting resource, so we um, had the possibility to design a pavilion for the <laughs> Dutch uh, consulate, uh, where Dutch companies would present themselves, which we started calling doors to sustainability, uh, using many of these doors, um, and um, actually allowing uh, Dutch uh, companies to present themselves within uh, in a sustainable fair over there. This is, of course, just a very few of these uh, doors, but uh, we every time need to illustrate and show what is possible and find uh, the uh, possibilities with working with local contractors, etc., to show if this is uh, uh, possible and feasible on such in such environments. Um, we also found a Dutch uh, or a, a Chinese partner to start constructing a Chinese harvest map. Um, th that's really interesting because the scale on which this can take place is, of course, at, well, I've now learned to calculate or to multiply all the numbers I have in my head with 10,000, then you're going into the Chinese uh, figures. Um, and we couldn't go use our uh, other harvest map because uh, China doesn't allow Google to work there. But this is now in beta version and, um, yeah, starting up uh, trade between supply and demand. Okay, so that's on the object level. Now, uh, the flow level um, gives different insights. Um, actually, since 2009, when we started um, looking if our approach would also work for uh, different types of flows than building materials, or uh, also on different scales like urban environments, um, we started investigating the flows in <coughs> our urban environments, and indeed, in the, um, the research position I had at the academy uh, in The Hague, I was going into depth into that. And uh, at that moment, we identified 14 different flows because uh, we were looking at the kind of standardization. Does it exist for what actually flows uh, are recognized? And we, there are some in industrial ecology, but there's not really a very defined uh, way to describe them. So uh, this is our effort to, to make them. And divide them in physical flows, energy flows, and value flows. And again, uh, knowledge <coughs> and money being uh, two of the flows that are often neglected, but have, of course, a very important influence in how our environment is being uh, uh, built up and developed. And uh, again, looking from our approach to create as much as possible value with what is already available, we started, started making uh, metabolist analysis of uh, urban environments like here in the south of the Netherlands where we analyzed where do the resources come from and after they're consumed where are they being transported to and wherever we are, do where we are making these analyses we find that the biggest volumes come from far either internationally or nationally are consumed once and then exported and this counts for the money flow as well the depending on the investment 
uh, the profits are also flowing out. So we are uh, looking at how can we not make autarkic environments, but environments that pro uh, profit optimally from the flows that are already present. An example where we started doing this again, um, yeah, is is an industrial zone, the Binkhorst in The Hague, that had, um, yeah, that went down from the 1970s, being a very uh, important automobile. In uh, industrial area for uh, the city of The Hague, um, and uh, in 2008, an, um, a big plan was made, but that of course coincided with the the crisis that occurred. So the municipality decided this to be a more organically growing environment and uh, leaving most of the urban environment at, as it was. And uh, with that, uh, Sabrina Lindemann uh, started uh, an intervention there to try to see if she could create a new community with the existing uh, companies because that's generally what happens on these kind of environments that every company has its own production process linked to region or uh, international skills but actually not so much to their neighbors. So she was looking if she could start up new interventions that would create a link between uh, the neighboring companies. Um, and by that, uh, trying to um, yeah, give new incentives for the development of the area. Um, actually, on the large scale, what happened is that uh, th this illustrates a little bit, the, this was a study that one of our interns uh, did for his, uh, uh, for his study, was uh, the flows that actually uh, passed through the area in the 1960s and in uh, 2015. And it already becomes clear the, the decline in uh, volumes of material that pass through. You see the inorganic and the organic materials that have been inventorized here, and that that was clear on, uh, yeah, uh, making it clear like what the uh, potential maybe in the area also was. Uh, the municipality asked us to <coughs> make a bit more in-depth analysis of this area. So this is really uh, top-down, you would say, uh, looking at what uh, kind of um, uh, branches of companies are uh, present in the area and based on statistics we didn't we weren't able to really uh, go to each company and analyze their flows but based on the national statistics uh, count the uh, yeah the, the the flows of materials that were passing through um, again showing the the inorganic and organic material on the left the resources on the right <coughs> Uh, the tons of products and the waste flows on the on the bottom. Uh, for the five biggest ones, we made a, f a little bit further analysis, uh, like for instance in the CO2 emissions that come with them. So the uh, resources, of course, have the biggest CO2 emissions on the left, and some um, uh, and the and the actually the CO2 emissions uh, that the waste generates or actually returns because of the recycling process. So this gives um, gave us a top uh, three of uh, bad performers in the area. The same we did for the economical value of the material. Um, so this on the left it shows that they buy for around 20 million uh, euros of uh, resources. Um, they create a value of around 2 billion euros, but they have a waste flow of around uh, 2 million euros uh, of um, yeah the, the resources that they are not putting in their products. Uh, on top of that, they need to pay for an additional 1.3 million euros to have it processed by a company. And this uh, budget is actually for us a really interesting, um, yeah, interesting uh, to understand because that is a, a potential to uh, start investing in new companies that actually can, are able to create value on these flows. Here, the estimated uh, added value that could be generated with only actually five of the uh, flows here would be around 20 million euros in that in that area alone. Um, saying that this is based on statistical uh, statistical data, but of course we're not uh, we can't be just um, happy with knowing the statistical data. So we also went to the biggest um, actors in the field, like for instance the waste collection center, seeing how much uh, they actually collect in reality and transport across uh, the Netherlands um, and found out that their uh, organic material actually would have a very good 
client in the area, when they turn it into biogas, there is already a a uh, gas station that sells green grass, they would like to sell it from uh, their the resources of their neighbor, of course. So um, this is now being uh, researched if that is going to, um, if they are going to make that connection uh, in the Binkhorst. Um, so that's actually the top-down approach. Um, the bottom-up approach is more from uh, the uh, Optech uh, Foundation that uh, started there. Like I said, she started uh, Sabrina Lindemann started um, creating initiatives, for instance, um, uh, brewing a local beer uh, with a beer brewer that liked the area so much that it moved into the area. And um, here we started doing analysis on the resources and the waste materials that a beer brewer has. One of them is the uh, spent grains. Um, it looks like this. Currently it's used as uh, feedstock. Um, low value, sometimes uh, the beer brewer even has to pay for uh, to have it being processed. Uh, but we found a bakery that uh, could actually use this as his ingredients instead of the grains and could actually save 15% of the ingredients that he would otherwise use. And he generally pays two euros per kilo for those ingredients. So there, the this uh, niche is actually uh, a possible a new business model for either one of them or a company that moves in between. And of course, we were looking at, can you do something with the waste bread that comes out of the bakery? Like a window factory, a bakery has uh, a percentage of a bread that it doesn't sell. Uh, it can be turned into biogas or it can be uh, used to make beer again, because that's actually how beer was invented in the first place. Um, the overall idea behind this is that you look at the company, uh, currently they have resources, um, the black arrows are uh, the non-considered uh, resources, uh, the waste flows and that are not turned into value. The red one is the main uh, focus of a company, the, the core business so to say. Uh, we look at if a company can actually create value on many more of these flows. And uh, the idea is that we use this knowledge to actually start connecting different companies with each other in an in a, uh, in a industrial environment. So we're working on an uh, app where actually you visualize uh, the different flows of companies and the interaction that is uh, occurring. I must say that the, our Chinese move uh, was quite a good one, at a quite right timing, so we um, signed a uh, contract, a collaboration contract. This is our Chinese partner signing collaboration contract with the industrial or with a circular uh, economy association of a whole province. <coughs> and um, now we started. Actually, uh, we won an, uh, uh, a competition to start developing a tool for this industrial terrain next to Guangzhou uh, to actually make companies enter their data that's a little bit different in China there the government can say just okay uh, you can uh, um, be active here if you are um, uh, uh, compiling with or actually if you are uh, collaborating with this uh, project so the organization we're now working with has to uh, make 300 uh, industrial zones in the in this province alone uh, in a way circular in the coming three years and uh, this is the first one we are going to collaborate with them and of course we hope that uh, we're going to scale up with it. The idea is that we uh, make a tool for them um, where actually the current situation can be mapped and um, later on the, the exchange that takes place between the different companies is being mapped and visualized. The, this project will start in January. So, but this is still, I would say, passive. You don't, you, uh, it maps what is already there and it shows the, the uh, maybe the improvements that are being made, uh, the, the uh, increased connectivity between actors and cycles that are taking place and the value that it's being created, but it doesn't allow you really to uh, build a strategy. So for that you need the systemic level and I would have liked to say that we also have a platform uh, for, uh, for that, but that is, uh, that is not yet the case. We have been working for some time with uh, Accept, uh, another uh, Rotterdam Utrecht based company to develop something that we call Simoto at the moment, where actually you're able to build 
a system environment and actually test different um, um, yeah, different new actors in an existing system to see what increased performance will happen. But this is a little bit bigger uh, project for the future and leads a little bit bigger investment than the, the uh, platforms we have been building so far. So for instance, for this beer brewer in the Binkhorst, um, uh, this would have generated probably a different approach. N right now, we just looked at what is available. We found a baker that could do something with uh, with the spent uh, spent grains. But if you look at it from a systemic way, you would uh, make this analysis coming from the systemic uh, design uh, cookbook, I would say, uh, where you see that uh, there's about 12 different product lines possible from just the waste of a beer brewer. And uh, you would do uh, run different tests, seeing uh, like what intervention uh, would you make and where would you actually start in order to generate the biggest impact in the system. Um, so that would have probably uh, made a different uh, approach. Um, to illustrate uh, a uh, yeah, development that we see popping up at many different uh, points in the globe is the new uh, economy growing on the, the waste of coffee. Um, also, in the after oil, one of the top 10 uh, flows being transported around the globe. Um, it's a typical... Um, a typical resource that only um, where only 0.2 percent of the total biomass that's needed generates the final value and all the other 99.8 percent is actually um, yeah wasted in the process so uh, that's also economically there's a big potential in uh, uh, generating new value with the uh, with the waste flows that occur in this process um, Again, what happens with uh, the also the remains of a uh, coffee machine like this is that it ends up in uh, waste incineration, at least in the Netherlands. And um, yeah, th actually there is a value in it, but uh, that value is not taken. Even more, uh, you need to pay for uh, processing uh, the waste, either uh, by municipal taxes or by uh, private costs. Um, Again, from the systemic design cookbook, um, there's uh, many different new models that uh, show how to generate value uh, in the different parts of the chain. And what is nice to see is that there are many companies, like for instance, Grow Holland, that started in the Netherlands, that actually start creating value on uh, coffee wastes. Um, hard to compete with uh, mushroom production uh, because that's uh, low skilled labor. Uh, large scale, if you want to start up a company, it's not possible. So you see, uh, this is what I mean by dynamic development. It's not a business model that someone thought, okay, I'm going to produce this much and this is going to be my product, but actually on the way they find out different, um, different uh, products and services that start to generate value for a company. Um, one of them is Rotterdam uh, from Rotterdam that actually at this moment have uh, around six different uh, services and products and byproducts from uh, the growing of mushrooms on the coffee waste, where the actual mushrooms don't uh, don't create the revenues, but uh, for instance, again, enzymes or uh, lubricants that uh, that come from it. Um, in order to make this knowledge systemic, because that's also what we are looking at, is uh, we create analysis like this. So from a mushroom uh, on coffee waste producer, we create a kind of puzzle piece that illustrates the typical flows of uh, such an actor. And this we see as an important uh, building block for uh, more, um, uh, yeah, more systemic environment, because the more of <coughs> these building blocks you have, the, more, the better you can actually connect different um, actors to each other. Also, uh, yeah, as well, uh, mushroom producer has CO2 emissions, it has waste heat, uh, other products that are maybe not used. Um, by knowing that, you can actually find another um, uh, building block that connects to it and uh, needs these resources. Um, like I said, we don't have a platform that is able to, uh, to support the systemic modeling of this yet, but we collect the knowledge and have, an, have a platform called Cyclifier, because we start calling these uh, these actors, cyclifiers, that 
document many of these examples. It's a, again an open source platform where around 120 of these cases are documented with the different flows that are, um, yeah, that uh, are designed to create value. Maybe I skip this one for the moment. It's uh, another example where I also want to show how actually the I wanted to show how the um, yeah the, the flow models can help you take decisions over time um, for different layers. But maybe to uh, show a little bit of illustrations again uh, in China, um, a lot of knowledge on this already has been built up. Uh, one of our students from uh, the Hague actually came up with this example where um, what you just saw was a landscape that produces silk, um, produces sugar, pig meat, fish, uh, all in one system. It's already uh, over 100 years old, this system. Um, but what you see is that because they're not connecting anymore to the current uh, industrial environment, it's a kind of isolated processes, Many of these don't generate enough value anymore and they're uh, transformed into either industrial zones with monofunction or uh, into uh, housing. So um, I think the approach of understanding uh, the flows that are already present will might help using this, uh, this approach uh, in actually adapting such an environment into, um, yeah, into higher value. Well, and to close off, uh, one of the bigger projects we're currently working on that is actually, yeah, for us a big test case on many of the different things I've been uh, showing before. And that's also, yeah, uh, like why are we doing this is to be able to test it in environments like this. This is uh, the Tropicana swim swimming pool next to the Maas in the center of Rotterdam. It was derelict for a couple of years, 12,500 square meters. Um, uh, Rotterdam, the company I just showed to you, they already started producing the mushrooms there and uh, last year, exactly one year ago, we found the investor that bought the building and uh, actually allows this to become a blue economy hub. So the idea is that this is a, um, and actually what it's being transformed in at the moment is a, uh, a hub for companies that are based on this blue economy and that actually are able to make new innovation in this way. So we uh, designed uh, the transformation for this, uh, for this building uh, where um, yeah, we also give bigger public access to it. So we are looking as well at the, not just at the resource flows, but also the user flows, for instance, how does it connect to the city and how uh, is user accessibility increased in this building that was uh, much more closed off. And um, at the moment, there is around 20 different companies, uh, of which some are already uh, on the, uh, in the site, that start already to exchange each other's uh, resources with each other. Um, one, for instance, is a, um, is a nice example. It's uh, Spiro. They uh, they make el they produce algae. They have a lot of waste heat. Uh, Okahout. No, there's a beekeeper that uh, can melt its wax with it, and Okahout uses the wax. Uh, of the beekeeper to make its wooden furniture. Um, yeah, Rotterdam also has exchange with a, with a, um, um, with a restaurant that's uh, already in there. And the idea behind it is that uh, currently we're in uh, the left situation where um, there's only very few companies uh, collected in the building. And by adding more, um, we actually are able to connect them together and also uh, decide where the ideal position of a new cyclifier in this building uh, is so that it starts to perform best and optimally uses the flows that are already there. So this is kind of scenario of how in the future uh, the increase of density in this area will also generate an optimized uh, uh, ecosystem in the building. And this is not something that's going to be static, uh, but again, it's a dynamic environment where it may be that a company is growing and moves out and another company may move in. And uh, the nice thing about how, uh, yeah, how we connect this together is that on the one hand, we are hired to redesign the building and transform it. On the other hand, uh, assist the organization in the flow management uh, in this building. So the tool we're going to build for China, uh, we, are, we can also use uh, within this building. Well, and that's uh, where I want to close uh, this session. Thank you. Thank you.